Hey everyone, Forrest here. Do you remember this part from the video about my journey to analyze all of JSBox corral harmonizations? This is a byproduct of many historical tuning systems and Bach would display his advocacy for equal temperament, or in other words, equality between all keys and his well-tempered clavier. Well, if you didn't watch the video, you definitely should. And if you did watch the video, it turns out that I was wrong. Was I totally wrong? Eh, I'm not so sure, but indeed, I was at least mostly wrong. And in this video, I have one sole purpose. Atonement. What I initially thought was an innocent fact about Bach and how the tunings of his time period might have influenced his choice of key in the chorales turned out to be well above my pay grade. The Well-Tempered Clavier a two-book series of 24 preludes and fugues representing the 12 unique keys of Western tonal theory, wasn't originally intended to be played in equal temperament. Turns out it was meant to be played in well temperament. And although there's a bit of historical backing to make an argument for equal temperament, it's mostly played that way nowadays because most music is played in equal temperament nowadays, namely 12-tone equal temperament, which we're going to talk about later. If you're already lost, don't sweat it. I'm going to break it down, hopefully as far back as I need to for it to make complete sense. But before we go further, I have to confess that before making that video, I wasn't aware that well temperament was its own thing. I thought it was Bach using language that referred to equal temperament being like the most well of the tuning systems of his time. Like it was time for musicians to ditch earlier tuning systems and adopt a truly equal division of the octave because of the possibilities of the keys, you know, not commonly explored because of their quirkiness and just the crunchiness of certain intervals. So now I know. It's its own thing. Back to the Well-Tempered Clavier. So Bach finished compiling the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier while he was employed in Cothen circa 1722, and the second book was completed during the latter part of his employment in Leipzig in 1742. Both books have a similar formal structure, they both start in the key of C major, then they alternate between going to the parallel minor, then they go up a half step to the next major key, and they continue that process until both of them conclude with a fugue in the key of B minor. Bach is, by far, the composer most associated with the idea of releasing a collection of works containing representatives in all keys. However, Bach was not the first composer to produce a work styled this way. In fact, Bach was aware of at least one work that had a similar structure composed by the lesser-known Johann Caspar Ferdinand Fischer in his work Ariadna Musica Neo Organoedum, which Bach recycled a few of Fischer's themes. Beyond this piece, several composers either preceded Bach or would go on to be influenced by Bach in writing works inspired by presenting individual pieces representative of an array of keys. Alright, so before we even talk about the differences between different documented temperaments Bach may or may not have even known about, before we even talk about what temperament is, I think it's important that we unwrap all the layers and get to the core of something that musicians do all the time. Tuning. So for starters, tuning can be a noun or a verb. As a noun, tuning describes the way that we adjust pitches based on a relationship, usually to a reference pitch, but you can tune in relationship to different pitches, individual of one another as well. You might be familiar with the term A440 or A432 because it's been topical on YouTube for the last couple of years. These are frequencies that remain fixed and all other pitches produced by an instrument will be in reference to this pitch at least most of the time. Like I said, you can have individual pitches have their own unique relationships with one another. You can tune, using tune as a verb here, you can tune your instrument however you want, but there are systems in place that aim to make certain combinations of pitches sound as natural as possible. So one of these systems is called just intonation, or JI for short. JI is a system that aims to keep harmonic ratios as simple as possible, harmonic ratios being the relationship between any two given pitches. A ratio represents what you'd need to multiply the reference pitch by in order to get its frequency. So for example, if we were using just intonation to 
divide an octave of C, and our reference C is equal to 256 hertz, the adjacent D has a ratio of 9 eighths. And that means that if we multiply 256 by 9 eighths, we can get D's frequency, which is 288 hertz. And all of these ratios are derived from the harmonic series, which is beyond the purview of this video, but you should do some research on what the harmonic series is if you want to get a better understanding of what tunings are in general. So also within the purview of just intonation is Pythagorean tuning. This tuning is based on the ratio of 3 over 2, which is commonly referred to as the most perfect or purest of perfect fifths. You can derive a Pythagorean tuning purely by stacking these pure fifths like this, and then turning them into an ascending stepwise scale like this. As you can see, there's still whole number ratios when you convert them down into a scale like this, but they're quite a bit more complicated than the earlier just intonation example. All right, so far the goal of these tunings is purity. Harmonies are to be as simple and as natural as possible using these tuning systems. So if that's the case, why don't we use these tunings more commonly? Don't we want our harmonies to sound as pure as possible? Well, some people do use tuning systems like these in their own music, but the main reason why these tuning systems aren't as popular nowadays are limitations regarding their flexibility. Sure, notes like these are going to sound pure in relation to your reference pitch, with our example being based on C. The further you deviate away from that C, you're taking a gamble based on how many tones are shared between the two keys. So in terms of C major, a key like G major or F major would work pretty well, but a key like B major would be quite noticeably out of tune. So how does one retain purity while achieving more flexibility? One solution is tempering intervals, or the distance between pairs of pitches. Tempering an interval involves adjusting one of the notes slightly to correct the way it would naturally occur in the tuning. These small adjustments are called commas, and different types of commas have been used historically with different goals. By adjusting the intervals by a little bit in certain tuning systems, it allows for theoretically the best of both worlds. You get purity and you get flexibility, at least to some degree. So one of these temperaments was used extensively during box time, and it was called mean tone temperament. I talked about mean tone temperament very, very briefly in my journey video. But in comparison to Pythagorean tuning's foundation being based on the perfect fifth, which is a ratio of 3 over 2, mean tone temperament lowers the fifth ever so slightly to achieve pure thirds, like the ones that occurred in the just intonation example. Just like how we stacked the fifths to demonstrate how Pythagorean tuning is constructed, stacking these slightly lower fifths eventually leads to a third with a harmonic ratio of 5 over 4, which is as pure as a third can sound. Mean tone temperaments are often classified by the comma used to alter each fifth. The three most common are the one-third, the one-fourth, and the one-fifth comma mean tone temperaments. The big takeaway here is that the larger of a comma that's taken off of each fifth leads to a closer, completely pure third. So by tempering our intervals, have we solved our problem with purity and flexibility? Partially, but no. Tempering intervals is about compromise, so you make slight, almost unperceivable adjustments to some pitches, with the end goal being a balanced sound and more harmonic flexibility. But the fact remains, if you detour too far from your reference pitch, you're more likely to sound out of tune, just less so than with just intonations. What if we imagine for a moment that purity is no longer our primary goal? Now we want flexibility. We want to have the ability to play in any key at any time without any perceivable difference between them. We still want our intervals to be as pure as we can manage, but not at the sake of meaning that any one key is unplayable because of quirky intervals or wacky ratios. Well, we finally arrived at well temperament. So while temperament isn't as much of a definable process as the previous tuning systems, it's more of a philosophy that's been achieved by different approaches. Based on the well temperament being used, a mixture of different interval ratios are applied that are somewhat based on tunings whose goals are oriented in purity. 
This involves going across each of the keys individually and tuning the fifths to try to create a more uniform result. In some cases, like Velati temperament, the process is more of like a blanket series of adjustments where half of the fifths are tuned justly, while the other half are adjusted by one sixth of a syntonic comma. Other well temperaments like Workmeister and Kellner's tunings involve going across every single key and tuning them distinctly, such that they're you know somewhat pure within themselves, but there are less perceivable differences when moving from one to the other. And this ultimately alludes to the premise of the well-tempered clavier. As it states in the title, the well-tempered clavier was a work written for clavier tuned using well-temperament. After all, Bach wrote a prelude and fugue for every key twice. And although there isn't any specification regarding what temperament was to be used, the idea of deviating away from conventions that arose from you know, dated tuning systems in favor of a more equitable tuning system makes sense for a composer like Bach, who's known for harmonic intricacy, to say the least. But we can go a step even further to shift to the complete pole of the pure, flexible spectrum. It just so happens that the tuning system we use today does away almost entirely with the idea of purity for the sake of equality, and that's equal temperament. So equal temperament is a tuning system that involves taking an octave and dividing it into equal parts. So in most cases, our octave is divided into 12 equally spaced half steps, but there's nothing stopping anyone in theory from dividing an octave into any number of equal steps. Some of the more noteworthy tunings are 19, 31, and 53 equal divisions. Most pianos today are tuned to 12 tone equal temperament, so it makes sense that most renditions of Bach's well-tempered clavier are played using a tuning style that might have objectively been more on brand for Bach's vision of complete interchangeability of key. As far as its history is concerned, evidence suggests that equal temperament's been theorized since the 1580s or so in both China and Europe, interestingly enough, so it's possible that Bach knew about it, but it didn't become adopted as a standard tuning practice in Europe until the late 18th century, even though a method for achieving equal temperament the way we know it today wasn't devised until the early 20th century. So even though musicians might have been tuning in so-called equal temperament since the late 1700s, it's likely that the tuning was somewhere in between a well temperament and the 12-tone equal temperament we commonly use today. But even if Bach did know about equal temperament, maybe writing an equal temperament would have missed the entire point of what well temperament provides that equal temperament doesn't. Even though well-tempered tuning systems move closer towards total equality of key, each key still has its own nuances and characteristics. I think each one of the pieces in the well-tempered clavier was meant to have its own personality, despite being flexible in terms of its ability to freely modulate between key. In music of the common practice period, it was general knowledge that certain keys had emotions attached to them, and I don't think Bach was any different. And with that being said, I think well temperament provided Bach with the right dose of flexibility he needed during his time with his musical capabilities. So in closing, I'm sorry that I said what I said in my original video, and I hope this video means that I've atoned. I learned a lot about tuning systems while researching this video, and to be completely honest, a lot of the math that goes into tunings went right over my head, which made understanding a lot of the concepts at the technical level very challenging for me. But I still learned a lot and I learned that there's a lot more to learn and uncover as well. If you haven't already liked the video and subscribed to the channel, please do so. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can pick up a copy of my ebook of all of Bach's chorale harmonizations in the description. Thanks so much for continuing to support the channel, and until next time, I hope you take care.